Islam 360. Today we're covering the story of Yajuj Majuj with Sheikh Kamal Amaki, who is one of our original Maghrib instructors. Inshallah, you are going to be more, more than impressed with the experience today, and I'm excited for you guys. Uh, mashallah, I'm, we're, we're, we're kind of talking right now in the Zoom chat. That's a promising sign, alhamdulillah in the Zoom chat with all those who are registered for Ramadan 360 um, about, uh, you know, who had, had experienced Sheikh Kamal before. And it seems like a lot of people are going to be new to this. So I'm very happy for you guys to be joining us for the first time. Um, everyone else here has started to change their names and add their cities. But if you're coming from social media, please drop your cities and your locations into the chat. We love to know where you're coming in from. And if you have not yet joined us or registered uh, for the internal course that's happening for free, the Prophets and Devils course, the stories of the righteous and the wicked in the Quran, head over to ramadan360.org and register for free so you get access to the lifetime recordings and all the resources and all the extra community benefits alhamdulillah of joining through zoom as well wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah to everyone who's still joining us um jazakumullah khair for coming through i haven't heard any unmuting so far so alhamdulillah oh no I spoke too soon. Um, guys, just make sure that you do keep yourself unmuted throughout the session, especially during Sheikh Saad's session as well. We have Sheikh Saad back. Alhamdulillah, his father uh, is out of surgery. Uh, please keep him in your du'as. May Allah grant him a quick and speedy recovery. Amin ya Rab. Um, but I will not be there for the last little part of today's session. I will be leaving as Sheikh Saad's session starts. So I will entrust you guys to make sure that you're being careful with your unmuting, that you're being very careful with the, with, uh, you know, the, the mic access and everything. And Sister Farisa, mashallah, our OG student uh, and our, our OG moderator will be here to support you guys in the chat as well. So I, you know, you guys are, are, are going to hold it down for us, inshallah ta'ala. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of conversation, mashallah, happening in the chat, but I can't keep up. So I'm going to let you guys continue, alhamdulillah, as we wait for Sheikh Kamal to join us and to kick off our session today. And I think actually, alhamdulillah, he is with us. So I'm excited. I will preface actually before we jump into the session as well, that you guys need to calm down. I saw the questions coming through yesterday as well. Some of you were behaving. Some of you were going very nitty gritty. I know the story of Yajuj Majuj is going to be uh, one that's going to bring about some interesting questions. Sheikh Kamal is the best person to ask. Yes, but let's focus, as we've mentioned before, on the on the, the the lessons that we're learning from the stories, on the you know practical impact that it's having in our lives, and a little bit less so on the you know where, who, what, when, why uh, that, that we're tempted as we are human uh, to, to kind of delve into. I don't want to take any more time. Sheikh Kamal, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you doing today? I see you unmuted. I see your camera, but I can't see you just yet. I have to keep it on speaker view. So uh, let me see if I can just quickly sneak to gallery view. People on YouTube, please don't mind me. Oh, I see you, Sheikh. Alhamdulillah. Um, this is a very mashallah background you have going on, Sheikh. Is this a green screen or is this your actual poster background? Oh, no, we can't hear you. That's why. Sheikh, uh, we see you perfectly. We just don't hear you just yet. Bismillah. Okie dokie. And I noticed that the screen's uh, surprisingly blank. I want to make sure that uh, those of you who've joined us now, you uh, you do have camera access, alhamdulillah. So please do join us on screen. Um, and uh, it doesn't have, you don't have to have a perfect background. We're going to find out soon if that is a virtual background behind Sheikh Kamal. You can throw one of those up, inshallah. You can do a blur action like Farisa is doing right now um, or and or a cool background like Hudayfa has on, inshallah. But we would love to see your faces, inshallah, on screen. It adds to the experience. And it adds to your experience as well. I find I'm a lot more tuned in even when I'm not hosting sessions, I'm tempted and I turn on my, my camera most times because it's a little bit more fun to feel engaged that way instead of just slouching and chilling <laughs> while I'm listening. Um, perfect. Jazak Mulkar, I see a couple more cameras. Have How about now? Oh, yes. Alhamdulillah. I hear you, Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. One second. Now I can't hear you. Just give me one second. Zoom. Okay. Bismillah. In just a second, please stand by. As Oh, I see another Kamal Maki, I think. There we go. Inshallah, Sheikh, you should be able to hear me as well now. And we'll give it a second. Mary Muhammad coming in from Canada. We're from Canada. Canada is a big place, inshallah. The <laughs> dream, um, we see you as well. Jazakumullah khair. And I'd love to see more faces as well. Mashallah, there's some OGs who are always holding it down. Um, Bismillah, Omar as well from Dallas, mashallah, awesome sauce. And we'd love to see more of you come through. Oh, awesome. Danish from New York, Shazia from New Jersey, Nasri, mashallah, with the, I was missing those trees. There we go, Bismillah. Done now, alhamdulillah. All right, can you hear me now? Oh, but I do hear a bit of an echo, Sheikh. Do you hear that as well? Okay. 
That's fine. Uh, I'm just going to use the built-in. Is this okay? Okay, hold on. Let's give it a quick test, inshallah. I don't think we can hear you right now, but do a one, two, one, two. Alhamdulillah. It's getting a little louder. If we can have you a wee bit closer. Okay, a little closer. Can we just have that, the top half? Huh? If we can get you a wee bit closer, inshallah. It's, it's, I can, we can hear the sound, but it's a little bit further away. Okay, okay. Oh, you know, as, as much as my setup is fancy, it's just always never, there's always some issues, subhanAllah. It's, okay. called, it's called the internet, alhamdulillah. It's, it's okay, alhamdulillah, Shaykh. It's, it's nice to have you here. And it, it's still early hours, early minutes, alhamdulillah. Those of you who are tuning in, Lama, welcome, welcome. It's been a minute. We missed you from Cochrane, Alberta. Um, Salma, wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah. Okay, person says it was better the first time the echo disappeared. Mm. Yeah, okay. I mean, I have, okay, I can do it. We'll do it ahead of peace. Okay, yeah, fine. Okay, we can hear you though, Sheikh. By the way, um, I mean, I've got a built-in mic, but then I yeah. can't hear you when I put it on. Ah, okay, that's not ideal. <laughs> Bismillah. Okay, Salam from the Netherlands, Mashallah. Jazak Mulkar Fadla for adding that to your name as well. Louisa from London, Wa Alaikum Assalam wa Rahmatullah. Um, mashallah. And again, those of you who are coming in still, I see the, the numbers, mashallah, continuously growing. Please do jump on screen and join us uh, as we kick off the session. Um, and then we have, who else do we have? N N Nadine from Jordan, mashallah. Samin from Bahrain. Wow, mashallah. What time is it in Jordan, Bahrain? I'm wondering if, if it's a similar time zone to me right now. Nazia from Leicester. I found out last year how to pronounce the word Leicester. I'm still proud of myself for it. Um, Omo Kher from Ohio. Fozia from Belgium. Suri from Australia, okay, you guys type too fast. Abdullah from Sri Lanka, mashallah. Sri Lanka, what time is it there? 12 a.m. right now for you, Nadine. Okay, so, so it is the same time zone, alhamdulillah, Bahrain and um, Jordan, I think, same time zone. Uh, Fatima from Manchester, um, Rana from India. Oh my God, too much, it's too fast. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna keep scrolling. Uh, Salam from Egypt, Umayma, mashallah, holding it down for Egypt. Any other Egyptians, mashallah, in this session? I'm curious. Um, Abdulazim from Antarctica, you're going to still claim that Abdulazim will allow it. Person from Canada, I'm assuming K-A-N. Um, and then 2.30 a.m. in Sri Lanka, mashallah, that's crazy. Um, thank you for Nazia from Leicester. <laughs> I appreciate the validation. 3.05 p.m. in Calgary, wow. Um, Irfan from Pakistan and mashallah. So most of you have added your names. Just a quick reminder for those who are coming in, uh, make sure that you do add your name and your city, the city of, of the country that you're coming in from. Uh, inshallah, uh, to your names by, by editing your name, click on, on participants, rename, and then change your name to your name and your city. From Austria and Vienna, mashallah, I've been wanting to go to, to Austria. Jazakum khair for everyone's kind comments. And I'm going to try to keep up on Facebook as well, mashallah. I know I see comments coming in uh, there on the Facebooks. Um, and actually a quick shout out before we begin as well. Alhamdulillah, we are uh, able to do a lot of the exciting things for Ramadan 360 because of the support our, our, of our awesome partners at Human Concern International. And I know there's an urgent appeal that they have going on uh, for the crisis in India. So an, another kind of uh, reminder for you guys to continuously uh, keep donating. When I donate, I just click for uh, the, the area of the highest need. And right now, India has the highest need with the, the tragic kind of situation with COVID right now um, and the complete lack of resources and support that they have for people who are uh, really sick and and are, are able to get even oxygen, subhanAllah, and who are struggling. I know it's such a privilege that we, most of us, many of us are coming in from the West or from uh, areas that have very great infrastructure. May Allah make it easy for those who aren't and who are still joining us as part of this experience. But I do encourage you guys to head over to humanconcern.org slash al-Maghrib. You can pick if you want to support in the, there's a Canadian and, and US option as well, but it's open for everyone across the world um, because they're supporting globally, a lot of global causes, inshallah. So please do head over there, inshallah, and show them some love and some support in Inshallah, Ada. Um, someone saying my volume might be down. Can you guys hear me properly, Inshallah? Please let me know if there's any issues with my volume. And then, Sheikh, if you're ready to test, we can test your volume as well. Yes, I'm ready. Oh, loud and clear, loud and clear. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> okay, amazing. Um, Jazakum Allah khair for joining us, Sheikh Kamal. Uh, for Ramadan 360, I was telling people earlier that uh, there was a lot of harassment I received since last Ramadan for when we would see Sheikh Kamal next. Alhamdulillah, he's here. So I expect a pause in the emails and the messages, inshallah. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the program once again this year, Sheikh Kamal Maki. We're super excited to hear your talk today on the topic of Yajuj and Majuj. And inshallah, we'll jump into it. I'll be there at the end to help you take any questions. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I'll pass it off to you. 
And do I have an hour or half an hour? You have 22 minutes, inshallah, for the time. 22 minutes, perfect. Excellent. Okay, perfect, alhamdulillah. All right. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulihi al-ameen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Amma ba'd. So, I'm happy that I have these 22 minutes because I didn't want to talk about the story of Ya'juj al-Ma'juj. That's not the issue. Everybody knows the story of Ya'juj al-Ma'juj. Everybody heard the story of Ma'juj and Ma'juj. That's not the problem. The problem are the theories. That's the problem. So let's tackle the theories. Where are they? Who are they? How can they be underground? Are they really underground? And every other speaker has got his little opinion and his theory about who they are, where they are. So let's tackle those issues, people. How about that for a plan? I think that's a great plan. No? Or yes? No, 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 Sheikh. It's all okay. yours. I was like, that's not what I prepared them for, but it's even better, inshallah. Okay, I mean, we could do that, but you can get that story anywhere. But the crazy thing is you're going to get all these analyses of where they are and, and all these theories, unresearched, unsubstantiated. So let's do that, inshallah, okay? All right, if you want to, in a nutshell, okay, in case you're completely lost, um, in Surah Al-Kahf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about a righteous king. He was known as Dhul Qarnain, Al Qarn, the horns here, because he had control of the eastern ends of the earth and the western ends. These are the two horns, the two ends of the earth, Al Qarnain. He did not have two horns, all right? So Dhul Qarnain, he took a number of journeys, and these are described in Surah Al Kahf. He took a journey to the east and then a journey to the west. And then another journey that could have been to the west or could have been really far, far north because it's he reached a, an area where the sun, uh, where, like, well, he reached in the western journey where the sun sets. And then an eastern area he met, well, not eastern. It could be a northern trip where he met a group of people that didn't get any shelter from the sun, which means there can be a primitive people. That's why they don't have shelter from the sun people who don't wear clothing, that's why they don't have shelter from the sun. Or it could also be, like some scholars said, a desert people. And it could also be, like some scholars believed, a very northern area. And in, and in the Arctic Circle, the sun rises and it stays up for six months. So in that sense, they don't get shelter from the sun, meaning they don't receive night. So this trip, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purposely did not give us too many clues and too many hints as to where it was. Because that's going to be where he meets a people that will complain of a, a group of troublemakers known as Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And then he's going to put them behind a barrier. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again hinted to this one because he doesn't want us to know where the barrier is. All right. Now, right from the beginning, people start saying, can it really be a barrier? And, and, and it's impossible for human beings to be trapped behind a barrier. First of all, people... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran described how, how Dhul Qarnain built okay, the labor. He asked for help from those people who complained. He had enough people. He had soldiers. But he said, ask, he asked them to help him. Because it's your problem. I'm going to involve you in it. That's what, what a great leader does. So then he told them to bring Zubar al-Hadid. Zubar, yani from Zubra, where, which are chunks of iron. And they were bringing big chunks of iron like this. Then he melted it. Yani, okay. And I'm, I'm trying not to get frustrated here. But for God's sake, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing all these things. All these things are physical. And all of them are to be taken literally. All right? Because if you're telling me, no, these are figurative. And the, and the barrier is not real. And it's not physical. Then what is the figurative interpretation of Zubar al-Hadid? Chunks of iron. And what does it mean, okay, in figuratively to melt these chunks of iron? So he melted it. And then he, it, this was a place between the two mountains. But Allah Azza wa Jalla didn't say Bain al Jabalain. He said Bain al Saddain. A Sadd in the Arabic language is like a dam. Why did Allah use this word? I'm telling you, there are a lot of clues here if you look carefully. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the word Saddain because if it's Jabalain and he blocked it, there will be another entrance. But a sed is a dam. And when you block off a river, when there's a dam and you block off a river, there's no way out. So Allah Azawajal specifically uses this word saddain so that we understand from this opening, Ya'juj and Ma'juj would come out once or twice a year or whatever it is, and they would wreak havoc. 
they will wreak havoc on the earth. And different scholars said, what is they kill, they steal. We don't know exactly what they did. But these people complained to this righteous king. There's a group called Ya'juj and Ma'juj. They come up from this opening and they wreak havoc. So he said, we're going to close it. And they can't come out from any other place because Allah called it Saddain, which means there's no other opening. So he says, you help me with the labor. Um, even though he has his soldiers, he involves them. He says, give me chunks of iron. He piled it up, covered that entrance. Then he melted all of it. Then, then he says uh, that let me ufrig alayhi qitara. I'm going to put molten copper on top of the iron. This was something that was known to he, human beings for hundreds or, or maybe thousands of years, thousands of years, that you cover iron with molten copper. Why? Because the copper, the iron, of course, it will rust and it will erode over a period of time. But iron doesn't. So, I mean, copper doesn't. So when you cover the iron with copper, there's a thin, dark layer that comes over the copper that's known as copper oxide, and it oxidizes like that, and it does not erode or deteriorate. So if you want something to be closed off for a long time, you have to cover it with something so that the iron doesn't just rust away. So all these things, uh, when he piled it between the two mountains, blow. So they used bellows. They used, what does blow mean? What does iron mean? What does melted mean? What does copper mean? Are these actual descriptions of an actual barrier, the sedane, or all of this is figurative? The scholars say anyone who says these things are figurative does not understand the Arabic language. All right. And, and on top of that, does not understand the Quran. There are some figurative things in the Quran, but you can see them very clearly. All right. It's very clear that this is not something actual. This is a parable. This is an example, method. But here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing soldiers, people working, melting, piling up between two mountains. So you cannot argue that it's not a real barrier. Now, some of you, okay, probably want me to refute someone, and I'm not going to mention him by name. I'm not going to mention Yasir Qadi at all during this talk. All right. <laughs> hey, he asked for it. He, so he started off with this whole zombies thing. I don't care about that. I don't care about the zombie thing. This is what I care about. I care about how when he was speaking about if you want to believe that they're behind the barrier, you feel free to believe it. But the, the body language was making it like if you're dumb enough to think they're actually physically behind the barrier, it's up to you. You want to believe that? I'm not going to say anything to you. You can believe they're behind the barrier. Yes, you better believe they're behind the barrier. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described in the Quran. That's what the authentic hadith described. The Prophet described even how organized they were. They have a guy like the foreman in charge and they dig every day. And then when it's time to stop, he says, we'll continue tomorrow. And then one day he says, we'll continue. And when they're almost able to see the sunlight, he will say, we'll continue tomorrow, inshallah. And that's the day they break out. So do you, from that description, understand that they're actually physically behind a barrier that they have to open and the Prophet ﷺ made a ring between his thumb and his forefinger like this. Is that actual or is this figuratively they open this much? Figuratively, figuratively they're, they're digging every day and they have a foreman who is figurative. What does that mean? It means nothing. Look, with the issues of the unseen, there's some guidelines. We cannot just jump around throwing theories everywhere. Like one guy came to me, he told me, I used to see him every Al Maghrib class. He's an older uncle. He's like, then I saw him like for the third time. He's like, I wrote a book. I'm like, that's fantastic. About Adam I said, great. So I'd love to read it. He said, but it has some new ideas. I said, I love new ideas. He said, Adam has a father. I said, get out of here. Adam has a father. This is your new idea. So you can't just, <laughs> Adam has a father. God. You cannot just start throwing things out like that. Like one person also came to me and he said, yeah, Juj and Majuj are not behind the barrier. All right. Now he's a scientist and the word scientist can be used to, to flex muscle. He says, I'm a scientist and science tells us that human beings cannot live without sunlight. First of all, this is not your field. You're not a biologist. You're not a doctor. He was in robotics. Okay. Don't try to scare me with the word scientist. You're in robotics. You don't know anything about the sun unless you deal with solar panels. 
So it just sounds good. You flex and you show some muscle. So I'm a scientist. We know from science that you cannot live without the sun. Don't say things without Googling them. This is the age of Google. Just check it out. Okay. You can live without the sun. There was a group. This was, um, I can't remember. I think it was 2012. There was a, a sect. Believe it or not, I, uh, I've known about this sect, but I didn't know they were Muslim. There was a, a Muslim sect in Russia that went underground for 10 years. 10 years. There was no sunlight at all. And they lived and they even had babies underground. And then they came out and, you know, it was like police and all that, all, all kinds of issues. They were discovered in 2012, but they were underground for 10 years with absolutely zero sunlight. Where did you get this idea from? That you cannot live without sunlight. These people lived underground. Oh, it can't be an underground cave because they don't have sunlight in the cave. I personally went to a cave in Malaysia. It's like basically naturally carved into the mountain. When you walk in, there's only one entrance. So if I walked in and someone sealed it off, I'm stuck there forever. And you might think, he's stuck in a cave, there's no sunlight. No, because it was a mountain, when you keep walking to the middle, there's actually sunlight coming from the peak of the mountain. There's an opening. You can't climb. It's way, way too high, but sunlight's coming in. There you go. I personally walked into a cave where there was sunlight. Where did you get this idea that a cave can't have sunlight? Where did you get this idea that the cave has to be, a, it's not a complete ecosystem and you cannot survive and blah, blah, blah. You remember in, um, I think it was Vietnam or Cambodia in the year 2014, they discovered an entire underground cave that was so huge. Okay, first of all, I want you to notice when they discovered it, how recently that was. 2014, that's not like 10, you know, that's not 100 years ago or 70 years ago, 2014. And this cave was so huge that they said it had its own ecosystem. You understand what that means? Ecosystem, complete system. It had its own rivers, all right, uh, its trees, everything was working. Oh, mashallah, now I'm seeing everybody for the first time. Look at all these folks, mashallah, check that out. I just was seeing myself for a minute. So anyways, this cave had its entire ecosystem. They just discovered it. Why am I keep mentioning, why do you keep mentioning that point? Because, and there's this guy, man, and I'm telling you, people, I'm telling you, uh, yes, I am very disturbed by this stuff it's irritating there's this guy he in in the arabic world you know he sells himself as the rational scientific muslim speaker you know and he always has you know his pictures like this everybody not smart he's the only one who's smart all right so he's got these videos he's like this it's ridiculous that uh that yajuj and majuj would be in a cave and uh they're behind the barrier and we've explored the entire earth. Same thing goes for the Dajjal. We've explored the entire earth. It can't be there. We have not explored. Did you Google it? We have not explored the entire earth. That is not true. Okay. So if you don't believe me, and you should, go now and Google unexplored parts of the earth. You're going to find some insane things. Insane. First of all, of all the caves, like we, we haven't discovered all the caves on earth. All right. Forget the ones we haven't discovered. The caves that we do know exist, we've only explored 10% of them. Only 10% of them. The Congo Basin, thick forestry in, in the forest, like in the middle of Africa, virtually unexplored, all right? Uh, in, in Bhutan, they have a, a law where any mountain that's over this many thousand feet is considered sacred. You're not allowed to explore those. Siberia, this is 55% of Russia's landmass for the most part, unexplored, okay? You've got the, the Amazon, unexplored. They, some scientists believe that it, will, it holds, you know, the, all the species of life on earth right now, that same 50% of that number could be, can be in the Amazon right now. It's so unexplored. There's so many unexplored parts of the world. And you're telling me that, oh, with Google Earth, we can find everything. You could be standing on top of the barrier of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, and you wouldn't even know you're standing on the barrier because thousands of years, it got covered with mud. It got covered with trees and plants and rocks and what have you. You could be standing on top of it, and you would know you're standing on it. So it is possible that they be in a cave, all right? It could, have, it could be gigantic. It has its own ecosystem. It could have sunlight. Everyone who's saying that's not possible, no, it is possible. 
And it is possible that you could stand right on top of it and not know that you're standing on top of the barrier because it's been covered by so many things. We've got so many unexplored mountain ranges in this world. It could be in any of these mountain ranges. How would you know? All right. So people always like think that, oh, it's impossible. Let me tell you something. Here's what's impossible. When you tell me they're not behind the barrier and there are a few people, speakers mostly, who said Juj and Juj are not behind the barrier. There is no barrier. They're just a people who are out on earth right now. So the challenge then, we ask them, who are these people? If you're saying that Juj, Juj is one of the countries, one of the nations of earth right now, all right, who are they then? And then they start giving you theories and it's embarrassing and I want to apologize in advance for regurgitating this nonsense, all right? One, one Kuwaiti speaker, he said, it's the, the yeah, Juj and Juj are the Chinese and the Indians. My apologies to you if you're from either one of these places. I'm like, look at this for God's sake. All right. This, what's the population of Kuwait? Do you know? 16. Okay. There are 16 people alive in Kuwait. That's it. All right. So a guy and 15 others are claiming that 100 million Muslims who live in India are from Juj and Majuj. Embarrassing. And then they say it's the Chinese. And there, the estimate is anywhere from 50, and the highest estimate says 100 million Muslims in China. If Let's just go with the, the 50 million Muslims in China. You call them Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Then the Indians, do they look like the physical description of Ya'juj and Ma'juj in the, in the Hadith? No, they don't. Yani, when you're trying to tell me the cave idea is ridiculous, I'm telling you Allah mentioned the cave explicitly and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned that, not the cave, the barrier, the physical entrapment of these people. It's mentioned in the hadith, it's mentioned in the Quran and that makes sense, that is plausible, that is sci makes scientific sense. What you're telling me doesn't make sense because now you have to point to a group of people on earth and call them Ya'juj and Ma'juj and you're doing it to a group of Muslims a lot of the times. And they don't even match the description. And if they match the description, like the Mongolians, you know, where you know where Mongolia is today, and the Mongolians physically look like the description of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, their faces. All right. But here's the other problem: the numbers don't add up because the numbers of Ya'juj and Ma'juj are huge. And in Sahih Bukhari, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Adam alayhi salam, Ikhraj nar take out those who are supposed to go to the hellfire. From your progeny, which means they're human, Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And Adam alayhi salam asks, how many, how, how, how are they? Yani he doesn't know their numbers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, one, from, from, yani, one from, from the normal people, let's call them, and 999 from Ya'juj and Ma'juj. That means their numbers are phenomenal, phenomenal. And many hadith indicate that, that when they come out, they will drink the lake of Tabariya. It's a lake now that around 20 million people have been drinking from, okay? They're going to finish it out completely. And on top of that, their arrows will be so many. The Prophet said, yes, yes, that the believers will use their spears and their arrows for fuel for years to come. That's how many they are. So, so it's, they're actually a people who are trapped and the scholars explain, why do they come out and try to kill everybody? Because they come out angry. Those are the people who trapped us here. So they come out and they start to kill everybody. They start to kill everybody. And then the other thing is, they come out right after Isa, alayhi salam. He returns and he kills the Dajjal. He kills the Dajjal. And the hadith indicates that they can't even celebrate. كذلك, while they're in that state, it's announced that Ya'juj and Ma'juj have broken out and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him that I have let out or set, set free or set out some of some servants of mine that no one can handle them. No one can take care of them. So Isa alayhi salam and the believers go hide in the mountain of At-Tur away from Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Then Ya'juj and Ma'juj come out and they start to kill everybody on earth. They're mad. They've been locked away for years. Tell me it's the, the Chinese and the Indians. And he, no, no, it's, it's very insulting. And if I'm from India and you tell me we're Yuj and Majuj, I would be very, very offended, you know? And if you tell me it's the Chinese, the Chinese, yachi, they are not Yuj and Majuj. They are right now making products at a great bargain. Everything's made, <laughs> made in China. Leave them, leave them alone.
Anyways, so the, the point is that people come up with a theory, all right? And one of the rules we have is that, and I think I have only like three minutes or so left, huh? Like two minutes, right? So one of, one of the things is that when you have a theory, it has to match all the descriptions in the hadith, all right? I'll give you two simple quick examples. The Mahdi. The Mahdi that's coming, his name will be Muhammad ibn Abdullah. He will have uh, like a, a large forehead and a nose with a bridge, okay? So, but he has other descriptions. Is it acceptable for you if someone comes to you and says, pledge to me? Why? My name is Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Okay. What? Well, the Mahdi will be Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And here's my ID. I'm Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Pledge to me. You will tell him, Na'i Habibi, you have to match the other descriptions of the Mahdi. All right? And your nose doesn't match. Okay? What if his nose matches? He has to match everything else. The TV. All right? These speakers who said, oh, the television is the Dajjal. The Dajjal is the television. Why? Because the hadith is that the Dajjal will enter into every home. The Dajjal has one eye. And it lies. That's why it's called the Dajjal. It's lies. So there's a TV in every home. It's one screen. And it's always lying. The commercials, sandwiches look great and they're sweaty and slow motion. Then when you go by the sandwich, it's like somebody stepped on it with a shoe and gave it to you. So, okay, the Dajjal is a lie. Habibi. What about all the other descriptions? I'm not going to say the name of the speaker. This is a very famous speaker. He said that the Dajjal, but he's not a scholar, but he said that the Dajjal is a television screen. All right. Now, let's apply the rest of the descriptions of the Dajjal. Does it match? First of all, the Dajjal cannot enter Mecca and Medina. And there are many television screens in Mecca and Medina. The Dajjal will cut a man in half. They still haven't invented a television that cuts you in half. And if they do, simply don't buy it. All right. The Dajjal, it says kafir on his forehead, not Sony. Okay. So you're, what you're saying doesn't make sense. It has to match all the descriptions. It has to match all the descriptions. To tell me that Juju and Majuja are from India, they don't even match the physical description. To tell me they're from Mongolia, they match the physical description. They don't match the numbers. So with issues of the unseen, red flag, anytime someone thinks they know everything and they have all the answers, that's the first red flag. And you should not listen to them. All right. I think I'll stop here. There'll probably be a lot of questions. <laughs> Jazakallah khair, Sheikh Kamal. Um, I realized that uh, I, I was very victorious at the beginning of this. We finally got Sheikh Kamal back at Ramadan 360. The hate mail was going to stop, but the fact that I'm cutting you off at the 30 minute mark, I'm realizing I'm probably going to get it back again. But everyone have mercy, inshallah. I already saw a lot of questions coming in, uh, private message in the chat, inshallah. Um, so I see more coming in right now, mashallah. So you guys can, can take a moment to write, inshallah couple of quick reminders. Um, as you all know, I mentioned earlier, Alhamdulillah, Sheikh Kamal did uh, one of our amazing virtual classes last year, The Desert Rose, the story of the Makkin Sira. And Alhamdulillah, we have so many more classes coming up this upcoming year that you guys can take full advantage of by registering either through your portal on the, the, the banner above or going to amalgrib.org slash all access and taking advantage of the past there and binging inshallah in the courses that we have coming up in the upcoming year. Um, with that being said, I'm being bombarded, Sheikh, so all the students are, are are private messaging me the questions. Um, so it. I'm going to try to, to pick through as many as, as I can um, and do as, do the best I can with them. So uh, I can't scroll all the way to the top because you guys are going a little bit wild. So I'm going to try to catch the first one, inshallah. And if I see it, perfect. Um, Fatima is asking, um, question for the Sheikh, about the names about, of Yajuj and Majuj, what does the Arabic language say? Is there a meaning behind these names? Yes, the scholars say that these names First of all, they're not Arabic names. The names are like non-Arab Ajami. And they say it indicates something that is extreme. Like um, in the Quran, Allah says, وَهَذَا مِلْحٌ أُجَاجِ that, that it's something very, very salty or very wild as in Ajij um, An-Nar when the, when the fire is blazing and it's wild. And that's why just in their names, there is a hint and an indication that they're not good, righteous people, okay, as we have in India and in, and in China, but they're actually wild, crazy, and extreme, like extreme saltiness and wildness of the fire. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Beautiful. The next question I see is, what is the physical description of, of Yajuj and Majuj? Okay. So the Prophet describes that their faces are flat, that their eyes are 
are like small. And then he describes that there are many, huge in numbers. And then it says, uh, or, or they're read in a, in a sha'af here. Now, some, some people or some speakers will say that means they have red hair, okay? But a sha'afa or sha'afat al-jabal means the, the top, the peak of the mountain, um, the summit, right? So when, when there's suhb al-sha'af, the hadith is suhb al-sha'af, suhb means red, sha'af means the top part is red. It doesn't mean their hair has to be red. It could also mean that they have a type of hat or helmet that's red. But the Prophet is giving you this visual of what they look like. They're like flat faced. They have, uh, you know, small eyes. And then they have something red on top, either their hair or a hat or a type of helmet. And, and the scholars say generally they kind of look like what the Mongolians look like today. And that's not an insult to anybody. Um, and Mohim, let, let's see if there are more questions. Beautiful. Um, the next question from uh, Masara is, is it okay to be afraid of Yajun and Majuj because of their story? It sounds very scary to me. And is it okay to make the eye not to be alive when they escape? Um, I mean, uh, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, I can't tell you it's not okay to be scared but of anything, but they're kind of, it seems that you're kind of far from their time period, okay? So uh, there's nothing to be as scared of. They're like more, okay, I'll give you, this is the best answer. The Prophet Sallallahu he told the companions about the Dajjal. And they said sometimes he would speak about the Dajjal to the point that we think he's behind the trees over there. And then one day he comes out of his tent, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they're talking about the Dajjal. And he doesn't want them to live their life scared and talking about something mysterious that they will never experience. So he tells them, should I not tell you of something that are far that I'm far more afraid for you than the Dajjal? And then he tells them about a shirk al-khafi, showing off and when you're doing something to show off to someone else. So they see his style. That was more realistic, something that you will encounter in your lifetime instead of being afraid of something you may, you're most likely will not encounter. So don't be afraid of... Yeah, juj and juj, be afraid of the <laughs> of shirk al khafi, you know, and and showing off in your deeds and so on and so forth. Allahu ta'ala. Awesome, awesome. Uh, the next question from Dadreen from the UK is: um, Do the descriptions that you mentioned of Yah Juj and Majuj match the other Abrahamic scriptures? Um, I'm not entirely sure about that. I cannot speak about that. I'm not exactly sure about the physical description, so I cannot uh, make something up here. Allahu ala. Um, uh, Abdullah from Belgium is asking, what's the biggest lesson we can take from the story of Yajuj and Majuj? That's a good question. I've never heard that one before. I don't know about the biggest lesson, but, but there are many lessons, okay? There are lessons on how to deal with the unseen. There are lessons in the story of Dhul Qarnayn. Like, why did Allah mention the story of Dhul Qarnayn and mention the test that he gave Dhul Qarnayn? And that's the thing about... Uh, Surah Al-Kahf, which we're supposed to recite every week, every Friday, that there is in it uh, people being tested in their religion, okay, the story of the young men in the cave, people tested in their knowledge, Musa alayhi salam with Al-Khadr, people tested in their power, Dhul Qarnayn, people tested in their wealth, the story of the two gardens. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned it, no doubt, because there are many tests and many, I mean, lessons in it, but it, يعني, for me right now, the biggest lesson from the story of Juj Majuj is to know that no one knows the unseen. And when it comes to an issue of the unseen, you cannot be certain. And it really shows you the power of Allah Azza wa Jal, that complete knowledge is with Allah Azza wa Jal. And it's not for anyone to try to solve that puzzle. Wallahu ta'ala a'la. Beautiful. The next question I see is uh, from, oh, hold on, I've lost it already. Um, Sheikh, will there be any uh, place that Yajuj and Majuj cannot enter, i.e. the Dajjal cannot enter Mecca and Medina? Is there something similar with these two groups? And that's from Anika in the UK. In the authentic hadith, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam describes that they will enter every home made of mud or straw, or they will enter everywhere. There's no city they can't go into. The only place they won't be able to go or, or they will not think of going would be into the mountain of At-Tur. That's where Isa alayhi salam and the believers will be hiding. So the scholars, they discuss this issue. How come they never found the believers in the mountain of At-Tur? And the scholars said something beautiful. They said, just like 
the believers believed in Yahjuj, Yahjuj, meaning in their existence, and they were not seen to them as a reward for them, Yahjuj and Majuj will not be able to see them. And that's why it will be the only successful hiding place. So if you are alive at that time, make sure you're on the side of Isa ibn Maryam, alayhi salam, and then you hide with him. Don't try to find your own hiding spot. They will find you. Wallahu alam. The next question is from Musa Wong. He's asking, do they give birth and do they die? Correct. Uh, they do give birth and they do die. They are human beings. And there are many weak hadith about their descriptions that they have fur, weak, fangs, weak, that they have ears so big that they lay one out as a mattress and the other as their blanket. All that is weak, okay? <laughs> All weak. What is authentic is that they're normal humans, but we do have uh, narrations from Ibn Umar and from other companions saying that they live a long time, that the least one of them gets to see a thousand of his offspring. So imagine if you could live long enough to see a thousand of your offspring and they live long enough to see a thousand of their offspring, like how many children are they having? So there are narrations to the effect that they actually just live longer and they, they just keep procreating. When that's, that explains their large numbers. Wallahu ta'ala ala. Uh, Jibril from Jersey is asking, um, well, you already answered the part of are the humans like us. Uh, he's asking, what do we know of the negative blood type? Is there some rumor or is there some knowledge about a negative blood type that they have? Of Yuj and Majuj? Yeah. I mean, I don't even know where this came from. Like, like people didn't even know about blood types at the time of these narrations. So there, I doubt a narration would have mentioned their blood type. And I doubt that anyone found the barrier and said, stick your finger out and took a sample. So I have no clue what you're talking about. <laughs> Maybe the, the questioner can clarify. Um, what do you call it? The, the next question from Zakia from the Netherlands is, is it truth that only a small group will survive Yajuj Majuj with Isa Islam in a grave? In a, in a grave? Yeah. That's no, the but it is true that it will be, a rel well, it doesn't have to be a very small number of people. It could be a large number of people that will hide in the mountain of Atur. To the point that the scholars had a discussion, they said, how will the mountain of Atur be big enough to, to house all these believers? So some of them said, one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will cause it to, to be enough for all of them, to, to, to house all of them. Two, they said it might be another tour in the future. There might be another place known as the mountain of Atur and the believers will hide there. But... The number is, if you compare it to the number of Muslims today, it could be relatively small, but it doesn't have to be a small band of, of men and women either. Allahu A'la. Perfect. Uh, someone else is asking, um, a couple people were asking, where is Mountain Atur located today? Um, uh, today, I, th I thought it would be, um, I don't know, somebody Google it. Wouldn't it be in the, in the Sinai? I don't know, Allah. I don't know. Inshallah, we'll wait for the Googler. Yes, somebody uh, Google it. Inshallah. Um, the next uh, question from uh, Liga from Los Angeles and someone else as well is how tall are they and are they mutants? Mutants? No, they're more like zombies. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> what are you shaking your head for? He's not with us anymore. Anyways... Uh... <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, mutants, I think the X-Men movies are, are getting too popular. What, what do you mean mutants? They're just normal human beings, but they just have more children. Okay, let me tell you something. You know, the race of people known as a Turk. Yeah, a Turk, meaning in English, they're referred to as Turkic people, right? So anyone from Turkey, from Azerbaijan, from Uzbekistan, from um, for the Uyghur, they're all known as Turkic people. Okay, you can Google it. I'm not making this up. In Arabic, they would be known as a Turk. Some scholars believe they were given the name a Turk لأنهم تركوا outside the barrier. They were Turk. Turk means left. They were left outside the barrier. So they're of the same race of people as Yajuj and Majuj. Those guys were trapped and those guys were left outside of the barrier. So we're not talking about zombies. We're not talking about mutants. We're not talking about people who are physically different from us. The only thing is they live longer and they have more children. 
And that's it. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. All right, beautiful. Um, I think I'm optimistic. I'm, I may have missed a few people. We've cleared out most of the questions. Honestly, 50% of it was how do they look like? So I think we we, we, we knocked out most of it with that. Inshallah, if anyone else has questions, um, either on YouTube or Facebook, or again, in the chat here, you're welcome to drop some. Um, let's... Uh, some people are begging for a joke and some people are begging for a Sudanese joke. So uh, you've been getting enough jokes, everyone, mashallah, throughout the hour. But <laughs> if you have something <laughs> off the top of your head. I think you guys would probably prefer some new material, right? Yes, inshallah. We can do a couple of minutes of that, inshallah, to end end off the session. Uh, and yes, I don't see any other questions that are that are not related to the same things that okay. we've covered. So, so first, sorry, first of all, uh, the Tour Mountain is in what we call the occupied territories. It's in Palestine. Okay, it's in Palestine. Um, that's it, we're done, yani. We're, we're, it's joke time now? I guess so, Sheikh, alhamdulillah. We're, we're actually at about 45 minutes as well. So, uh, inshallah, oh. we won't keep you, we won't make you do a whole lesson uh, with us. But uh, if you have anything else, actually, I had a question, Sheikh. I know you read a lot to get the content for your talks. How much did you have to read on this topic, just out of curiosity, and any recommendations that you would give to the layman um, in the audience as well? Um, like, usually for, for a talk, I'll prepare from like 19, 20 different sources. Uh, this one, I can't remember. It's been a while, but it, but I don't think it was that many. It was probably like, probably 12, 13 different sources, something like that. Do you have, and I know you had classes and you had lectures on this topic. Is there anything more extensive that we can search up, inshallah, uh, to assuage those people who wanted more time? Um, yes. I can recommend. Uh, basically, uh, last Ramadan. Because you know, it was that COVID Ramadan, so we put out a lot of content. So I did uh, the signs of the hour in detail, and the Ajujin Majuj in particular. Uh, I think we spent two, three episodes on that. And that was uh, all uploaded on our Masjid uh, YouTube uh, channel. So our Masjid is uh, Clear Lake Islamic Center, which is uh, CLIC, C L I C, Clear Lake Islamic Center. We have a channel on YouTube and you'll find the signs of the hour by Kamal al-Makki. Just write signs of the hour Kamal al-Makki. Then in the caption, you will find like the picture of a handsome person. That's the moderator. Then you click on that. Then I show up. Jazakum Allah khair, Sheikh. Um, I'm going to try to get to the top of the chat here and shall drop that in here as well so that you guys can uh, can jump into that series, inshallah, and share with us uh, your reflections after you've watched it. Jazakum Allah khair, Sheikh Kamal. Um, mashallah, there's... Listen, a, yes, I, I, I do have one joke that comes to mind, but I was like uh, hesitant because, you know, it's just the only one that comes to mind. All right. So this is uh, this is this uh, an issue. This is something that started to happen in Sudan, where I'm, I'm originally from. Uh, like every time a man dies, his his secret wife just suddenly shows up at the funeral. He's like, I used to be married to him, what have you. So this guy died, and then a few days later, a woman dressed in black with two kids knocks on the door. So the widow opens the door. She's like, Who are you? She's like, The one who passed away. That was my husband. She was like, why, why are you so heartless? I just lost my husband and you're trying to break my heart twice. She is like, listen, he was my husband. We were married in secret and these are his kids. So the lady is like, listen, I've known this man for 20 years and he has the same routine. He goes to work. He comes back home. He goes to Masjid Maryam. She says, I'm Maryam. All right, everybody. I know nobody likes polygamy jokes, but it was the only one I could think of. Salam alaikum. Sheikh Kamal Maki for joining us and for entertaining us for another session. I can see why we want so much of you, alhamdulillah, on Ramadan 360. And firstly, this is the only session we have with him for this program, but inshallah, we look forward to stalking you uh, through Clear Lake Islamic Center's live sessions uh, and through your online uh, programs as well, inshallah ta'ala. This was honestly a pleasure. I hope I won't have to take this recording down, <laughs> inshallah. Um, and it's, it's it's been an honor to have you back with us for Send Ramadan. Send it to Yasir Qadi, inshallah. <laughs> I'll leave it to you to send it in, Sean. Maybe we'll tag him. Okay. Stop Allah. Stop Allah. Don't do that. <laughs> All right. Jazak Malkhair, Sheikh. It's been a pleasure. Uh, take care of yourself. Enjoy the rest of your Ramadan. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum. Salam. Thank you, everybody. Assalamu alaikum.
All right, everyone. I hope that you enjoyed that treat. I don't think I've seen the, uh, the chat popping as crazy as it had, has been for a minute now. So alhamdulillah for that. Uh, I'm glad that you enjoyed the experience with Sheikh Kamal. And I'm glad that it was a good one for those uh, many of you who were saying it was your first time. Uh, I hope it was a great time. Alhamdulillah as well. Another quick reminder, Sheikh Kamal is one of our Maghrib, uh, beloved OG Al Maghrib instructors. Uh, he did teach a class with us, alhamdulillah, the, this past year, a live virtual class uh, on the topic of the Makkin Sira called the Desert Rose. And alhamdulillah, we have a lot of the instructors as part of our programming throughout this series throughout Ramadan 360 who have classes with us who have longer sessions and amazing experiences where they have you know studied and, and they've, they've really delved deep into a topic so you're not just listening to a 30 minute talk uh, over one hour although these are a, a lovely consistent thing to do every day you are now diving deep into it over a lot series of live sessions over a couple of weekends with a community and on a course that you're registered for together make sure that you take full advantage as I mentioned before of the all access pass that allows you to get access to all of these classes, alhamdulillah, um, and anything that we launch in the next year that's live, virtual, or that's online, that's uh, professionally filmed, and of course, the Faith Essentials uh, structure as well, where you can find the old talks for Ramadan 360 as well from Sheikh Kamal Shukri. Thank you, Farisa, for dropping that link in the chat as well, inshallah. I'm going to quickly flex because, mashallah, sister uh, Rolda was doing that yesterday as well. These are some of some of uh, the courses I've taken since we've gotten a new uh, portal for the all access, and sorry, for the virtual classes this past year. Alhamdulillah, you can see I was able to take several classes a couple of times. Sheikh Amar has the venom and the serum. Sheikh Abu Isa has the last breath um, and pure pesa. Sheikh, Sheikh Sinaman Hani uh, has signs, the uh, signs, God, atheism, and the pursuit of truth. Sadatamiya Zubair had I am her. So Alhamdulillah, some of our amazing scholars that you've been seeing consistently have got full on classes that they took months and years to develop and teach uh, either previously on site and now available to you virtually live so that you can ask them all the questions your hearts desire and inshallah have that direct interaction that you've been enjoying uh, throughout these sessions as well, alhamdulillah. So head over to amagrib.org slash all access uh, to take full advantage of them. And they will be available for registration if you do not, for whatever reason, uh, if you're not able to sign up for the pass and you're only able to make it a class or two this year, just have her, head over to amagrib.org. There's a live virtual section where you can keep up with all the classes that are available uh, for registration right now. I know Sheikh Sidna Manhani's and Sheikh Saad Taslim's classes are available right now. Quranic Vibes is one of the first classes that we're going to have with Sheikh Saad, inshallah, after Ramadan concludes. And with that being said, alhamdulillah, we have Sheikh Saad with us today. Uh, so I'm excited for us to jump back into the Quranic reflection circles with Shaysad Taslim. Um, we missed him for one day yesterday. Alhamdulillah, we had Sheikh Mahmoud Faqih holding down the fort, and now we have Sheikh Saad back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, how are you doing today? Wa alaikum wa salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm doing well. Uh, I just realized I have to follow Sheikh Kamal Maki, which is um, never easy uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, the most uh, prominent reason being that he is uh, one of the most interesting people uh, to listen to. So I feel like, you know, I've already failed, you know, having to follow him up. It's going to be really, really difficult. Uh, may Allah protect him and, and preserve him. Uh, I see he's still on. I don't know if he's like on, on, or if he's just like passively on. Uh, but I just wanted to give him salams. I don't know if he's, if you're here, Sheikh. No? Okay. <laughs> no, I say that because uh, Sheikh Kamal, he, uh, he, we used to be neighbors. Uh, he, he used to live in Virginia. So not like real neighbors, but state neighbors. Uh, but he used to live in Virginia. I used to live in Maryland. Um, I think our houses were maybe about 30, 45 minutes away. Uh, but with that, you know, we actually saw each other. We never saw each other locally. We saw each other like outside when we were at Ilmfest in like Malaysia or something like that. Uh, and so th the only time I get to talk to him is, you know, when I see him at an event. Uh, so yeah, so that's why, you know, Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. It's, good, it's, good to, it's good to see him even for uh, a short glimpse, Alhamdulillah. Okay, uh, Bismillah, let's, uh, let's get started with uh, today's uh, reflection circle, inshallah. <clears throat> bismillah, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين اللهم أرنا الحق حق ورزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته to everyone um, good to be back alhamdulillah uh, to continue uh, with our daily sessions uh, today we are in juz number 18 or the 18th portion of the Quran. Uh, Juz number 18 is uh, 
there's three surahs that you go over in just number 18. Uh, number one, Surah Al-Mu'minun, which is, which is um, uh, Surah number 23. Uh, Surah An-Nur, which is uh, Surah number 24. And Surah Al-Furqan, uh, but only the beginning portion of it. So uh, from the beginning until verse number 20. Once again, uh, Surah Al-Mu'minun, all of it. Uh, Surah An-Nur and Surah Al uh, all of that as well. And Surah Al-Furqan uh, from the beginning until verse number 20. Uh, by the way, Sheikh Kamal has a class on Surah An-Nur which I highly, highly recommend uh, if you haven't taken it yet. Any class you can get to take with Sheikh Kamal, uh, definitely take it. And I'm not just saying this because, because he's here or he is here. I don't know if he's actually here. Uh, but uh, Sheikh Walid, uh, who I'm sure you know very well, uh, once he told me about Sheikh Kamal, he said that uh, I don't know anyone who prepares as extensively for their seminars uh, as Kamal al-Makki. Like his research is on point. So, you know, uh, you think like, okay, I'm going to take a class on this particular topic. Uh, you know, does this person know everything there is to know about this topic? That person usually is, is Sheikh Kamal. He, he actually made me and I know a few other instructors up our game as well. Uh, so when I was teaching the, the seminar on, uh, on the shaitan, uh, deception and study of the shaitan, uh, one of the ways I approached it is I said, you know, how would Sheikh Kamal approach this topic? And that is basically, um, can I research anything and everything that someone would possibly want to know about uh, the shaitan. And it was only that I, until that I you know, got to that level that I was like, okay, maybe I'm prepared to teach the seminar inshallah. Uh, but yeah, so his, his, uh, his session on, um, uh, on his uh, seminar on Surah An-Nur is very good. He get, goes into a lot of uh, detail. Uh, so we're not gonna cover Surah An-Nur today. Uh, we're gonna go to Surah Al-Mu'minun uh, and in particular verse number 61, 61. Uh, as always, if we could have uh, someone recite it for us, inshallah ta'ala, recite um, verse number 61 from Surah Al-Mu'minun, the Arabic part. Uh, and I'm going to let Hafsa, Sister Hafsa pick who's going to do that recitation, inshallah. All right, Bismillah. I'm actually going to head out, inshallah, for this part of the session. So I'm going to pick someone, of course, because the Sheikh would not let me go for one day. Um, I think we haven't heard from Munir in a while. So I think we'll take Munir from Dallas, inshallah. And uh, today, everyone, Sister Farisa is going to just ask you guys to unmute. You guys just accept that on the screen. And that way you'll be able to unmute yourself, inshallah, just so that there's no any accidental unmuting, inshallah. So we'll quickly do that really quickly for uh, Brother Munir, inshallah. And I will see you guys tomorrow. Jazakumullah khair. Salam. Right. Salam. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi Actually, if you could do me a favor, and uh, um, even though we're covering 61, if you could uh, recite 61 and 62 as well. So both, okay. inshallah. Okay. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Ulaika yusari'una fil khayrati wa hum laha sabiqoon. Wa la nukallifu nafsan illa wusa'aha. وَلَدَيْنَا كِتَابٌ يَنْطِقُ بِالْحَقِّ وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ Ahsant. Jazakallah khair. Barakallah feek. Thank you so much for reciting that. So in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أُولَٰئِكَ يُسَارِعُونَ فِي الْخَيْرَاتِ وَهُمْ لَهَا السَّابِقُونَ That it is they who race to do good deeds, um, always taking the lead. Now, to understand who the they uh, is in this, uh, in this verse, actually, we can go to the surah as a whole, or the title of the surah, um, and the very beginning of the surah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you know, we know the surah is called Surah Al-Mu'minun, and the surah begins with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, Qad aflah al -mu'minun, That certainly the believers are successful, or successful are the believers, and then this surah has many of the attributes or characteristics or descriptions uh, of the mu'minun. Uh, that what are the qualities that the mu'minun have that quantify or qualify, I should say, that first ayah of Surah Al-Mu'minun. So uh, certainly the believers are successful. Okay, why are they successful? Then Allah gives us many of the uh, qualities and attributes of the believers that make them uh, successful. Now, further down, we get into the, into the surah, we come across uh, verse number 61. And this is uh, continuing on with speaking about the believers, uh, speaking about those who are uh, successful. And so one of the characteristics that we have here of those who are 
successful is Allah says, Ulaika yusari'una fil khayrat. That it is they who race to do good deeds. Wahum uh, sabiqun, uh, And they are uh, always taking the lead. Um, so what we learn here first and foremost uh, is that one of the characteristics of the believers, of the successful believers, is that when it comes to doing good, uh, they are always at the front. They try their best to be the first uh, to do good. And they try to be those who set the example for uh, others. And this is a level of ihsan. And we've talked about ihsan before, but a level of excellence, uh, basically going above and beyond. Now, you know, when we do, we take a look at an act of goodness, right? And this is one of the things I was reflecting upon when it comes to this verse that, you know, if we take a look at act of, a, of an act, we take a look at an act of goodness. Um, let's take the example of something that Allah has made uh, an obligation, right? Something that is fard upon us. Anyone who carries out that obligation, they have fulfilled that obligation and they will be inshallah ta'ala rewarded for it. And inshallah ta'ala, they're not uh, sinful for leaving that deed. And, and so they have the credit for that. But those who uh, rush to do it, those who race to do it, those who are the first to do it, they have an opportunity to get an added level of reward by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have an, uh, an ability, and that's part of the ihsan, is to, is to do, be you know, the first, the early ones, uh, you know, the, the, first to, the first to do it. Many, many reasons why. Amongst those reasons uh, is the fact that we can uh, inspire other people to do it as well. Uh, we know uh, charity, for example, you know, the, the default when it comes to charity is that we, can, we should actually hide our charity, right? We shouldn't publicize uh, the charity that we give. The exception to that rule or the exception to that default is this reason today. And the reason is we want to rush to do it so that we can inspire other people uh, to do it as well. We have that famous story uh, mentioned in uh, Sunan Abi Dawood, uh, narrated by Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, I believe himself. Uh, he said that, you know, one day the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa uh, asked the companions to give some charity. And he said, I happen to have, you know, uh, some charity to give on that day. And he said, you know, I, I you know, and he, he was always in competition with Abu Bakr radiallahu an. Uh, so he said, he thought to himself that this is the day I can beat him, right? And in this, and, and really the theme of this verse is competition for, for goodness, right? So you race to do something, meaning you want to be the first to do it, right? Uh, to get that reward of, I inspired other people to do it, not to show off or not to, you know, be praised or anything like that, but who was the source of the inspiration, right? And, and I'll, I'll get to the evidence for that, inshallah. Uh, but um, so uh, here uh, we find uh, uh, Umar radiallahu anhu, he says, you know, today I, I thought to myself that I can, I can outdo Abu Bakr. Uh, he said, you know, if, if uh, uh, he said, um, uh, he, I gathered half of what I owned, half of my wealth, half of my property, and I gave it uh, to the Prophet وسلم, And I gave it for the sake of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And the Prophet وسلم, he said, uh, He said, "What have you left for your family?" And he said, "I have left the other half of my property, of my wealth, for my family." And you would think, Subhanallah, and this is amazing. Just, just like, just this point in the story itself is amazing. If you put yourself in that situation. Imagine, especially those of you who are you know, married and you, you have an income and you provide for your, your family and you have a budget and so on and so forth. You're responsible for other people. Imagine showing up to the masjid one day and like giving 50% of everything that you own, right? And it's not just as 50% of what's in my bank. It's 50% of what I own, right? Everything, all my assets, everything to give for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That'd be a very, very difficult thing uh, for someone to even fathom. SubhanAllah, you know, when we go to fundraisers, uh, and someone drops like five thousand dollars or something. We're like, whoa! Like that's just like I can't imagine. Like what level of iman you you came to that you dropped like five thousand uh, dollars? But for that person, that five thousand dollars may not be uh, even you know two percent of what they own or ten percent of what they own. Imagine how we would feel when we hear that someone gave fifty percent of what they own. Uh, so Umar radiAllahu an he gives fifty percent. And then he said, uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he came with his property and he, he, he gave it. 
Uh, and the Prophet وسلم, he said, Mada ahlik? He said, What have you left for your family? And he said, Certainly, I have left uh, Allah and His Messenger for my family, meaning I've given everything. There's nothing left. I don't own anything. There's no property that I have. This is all for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And actually, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he said, um, I learned that day, you know, I, I, that I will never try to outdo him, right? And I'm, I'm not going to be able to outdo Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu uh, But the point here is that uh, Abu Bakr just naturally radiallahu, radiallahu anhu, he had that characteristic of wanting to do more than other people. One could do as much as possible. And Umar tried, radiallahu anhu, tried to compete with him to get that reward. Now, what is the evidence for that, for, 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 the insp- the ins- for inspiring others to be good for us? Well, a uh, few different narrations amongst them is the Prophet sallallahu He said, Man sanna fil islami sunnatan hasana, falahu ajruha wa ajru man amila biha ila yawm al qiyamah. He said, sallallahu alayhi that whoever starts something good in Islam, they will have the reward of what they did, and they will have the reward of every single person who follows them. And then now pause the narration. This is me saying, if it wasn't amazing enough right now, the second part is he takes it to a whole nother level. The Prophet, the Prophet he said, Ila yawmil qiyama, until the day of resurrection. Then imagine, subhanAllah, we have died, we have passed away from this life, we have left this world. And because we started something good, we inspired, we might have inspired one person, by the way, but that in person inspired other people and that inspired other people. And it kept going and going and going and going and going. And we come on the day of judgment and we see like um, a, a, a large group of people whose, whose reward that we, that we get. And in one narration, the prophets, I said, he said, uh, that it doesn't take away from their reward. We're just given the reward as they got the reward. So they get benefit and we get benefit as well. So this is one of the reasons, one of the evidences uh, for us wanting to be the first, us wanting to, to get that special rank, the special status of, you know, I started something and then people followed me in it. And this is very different to, it's almost an exact opposition to the way we live our lives uh, today. Uh, unfortunately, we do it, you know, a lot of us, it's about attention. It's like, I want to be the first, so I get the attention for it. So that, you know, everyone looks at me and for the companions uh, and what Allah is mentioning here is not about the attention. It's not about, um, it's not about, you know, how many people recognize me for it. It's about how much reward do I get from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if I manage to be the first in this, then I can be rewarded uh, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I can have my reward multiplied and multiplied and and multiplied. Uh, By the way, there is the other um, there is the uh, other, we should say, other side of the coin, um, which is uh, those people who rush to do bad deeds or, or evil deeds. And so, you know, if the believers, uh, the, the pious believers are those who rush to do good deeds, well, then the opposite of that is rushing to do something bad or rushing to do something which is evil, right? And that is something that we want to be very, very, very careful about. And one of the reflections I had upon this verse is that when it comes to goodness, we want to be, we want to rush. We want to be the first. We want to do you know, as quickly as we can get it done. We want to do it. But when it comes to evil deeds or bad deeds, well, hopefully I'm going to give everyone the benefit of the doubt. We wouldn't want to do a bad deed. So how could, the, how could this apply to us? Well, it could apply to us in the questionable matters, right? The doubtful matters, uh, which are mentioned in the sunnah as well. The doubtful matters, we want to be the person who delays it and delays it and delays it, hopefully to the point that we leave it all together, right? Because we don't want to be the first. So if it is a questionable matter, don't be uh, the first. And the example that comes to mind, subhanAllah, I remember some years ago, um, I logged on to Twitter and I saw some tweets about halal nail polish. People talk about halal nail polish, halal nail polish is a big thing. And I saw like tweets, people are like, you know, oh, wow, there's a new nail polish. And I know y'all know about it now, but back then it was like unheard of. Um, you know, the, uh, there's a new nail, it's, it's breathable nail polish, right? Uh, water permeable, you know, that, that's the official term for it, I believe. So, you know, water goes through it and immediately people are like, oh, there you go. And that means now it's halal nail polish. And halal meaning that, um, you know, we can, we can make wudu over it. You know, that question of whether a person can make breathable nail polish. Yes, exactly. Whether you can make wudu over the nail polish or not. And I saw people giving their opinions left and right. 
uh, and um, I, people tweeted at you know people tweeted at me, and they're like, you know, what is the ruling of this? And my my response was, hey, I don't know, right? The default is what I already know about nail polish, and the norm of nail polish is that water can't get through it. So our wudu, uh, you know, would not be complete because the water wouldn't reach you know the uh, our complete hands. I said that's what I know about nail polish. If something new has come, we need to be careful, right? We need to be we need to we need to check to see if this is really different now. And I saw it was very, it was very, I was actually like kind of hurt that so many people were rushing to give a fatwa, rushing to give an answer without even checking this. And, and me, myself, I remember, um, you know, I teach a class called Trends, which is the fit of clothing. And we go over all the issues related to clothing and dress and so on and so forth. And for that seminar, I knew this, is, this issue is gonna come up because, you know, issues of, of clothing and beauty and all that. And so I decided for myself, I said, look, if I'm gonna have to answer this question, uh, and by then, by the time I, you know, was teaching my class, there I had already read, you know, opinions and fatawa from even scholars, but I didn't feel comfortable saying anything unless I personally checked it myself. So me and my wife, we ordered that nail polish, we did our own test and all that kind of stuff. Um, spoiler, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spoil this for you. So take the seminar if you want to know the answer to that. Inshallah. Um, but uh, so I, I, I was like, look, I don't want the responsibility of saying something and then now it's not just especially you know and this is the other thing i've been thinking about with this verse especially when you're in a position of leadership the responsibility gets uh multiplied because instead of maybe one or two people following you you have maybe hundreds maybe thousands of people that are following you imagine saying something which is wrong imagine saying something which is bad and now this is so much more that one has to answer answer for yes allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given a very high rank to the scholars, uh, but also their responsibility is very high as well. And now anyone in the position of, you know, nowadays we have influencers and, and so on and so forth. Anyone in a position when you have a following or anything like that online, likewise, it's actually kind of sad because, you know, sometimes you have influence who are influencers who are not people of knowledge. They just have the influence. So they don't have any of the merits. They just have all the responsibility. May Allah protect us. But you know, anyone in a position of, of leadership, it's a it's a it's a it's a heavy burden that they have to carry. Meaning, when they speak on something, uh, they have to you know they they may have to deal with the consequences uh, of of that. And look, scholars aren't held accountable for making a mistake, but they are. They may be held accountable for not doing for not doing their due diligence, right? So if a scholar does their due diligence, they seek the knowledge, they do ijtihad, they work hard to come to a conclusion and the scholar gives a fatwa and they're sincere with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they're wrong, they're not held accountable for that. And actually the Prophet Sallallahu told us um, that they're rewarded for that, even though they're incorrect. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi told us that a scholar who is correct gets two rewards. First for, for, for being correct and also for putting the work in to come to that answer. And the scholar who's incorrect gets one reward, right? But what a person will be or possibly will be held accountable for is whether they did the due diligence or not. Are they speaking with knowledge? Are they qualified to speak on this matter? Um, or are they speaking out of turn? Are they speaking without um, being qualified or in a position that they can give an answer? That is something uh, that all of us need to be uh, careful about. Right. So the other side of the coin, as we said, is uh, doing some, being quick and setting the example in something which is bad. And even uh, the hadith that I quoted earlier, uh, you know, that whoever starts or does something good in Islam, uh, the other part of the hadith is, man sanna fil islami sunnatan sayyia, falahu wizruha, wa wizru man amila biha ila yawm al qiyama. That someone who does something bad or evil in Islam, they will carry the burden or the weight of their sin. And they will carry the weight of the sin of every person who followed them. And this is very scary, subhanAllah, until the day of resurrection, not taking away from the sin of the other people. This is a burden that they will have to carry uh, if they inspired other people. And this is obviously knowingly, either knowingly they inspired people or they did it out of recklessness or carelessness or negligence, right? So someone speaking out of Islam, being negligent, right? I mean, they're just speaking left and right, which subhanAllah in our times is very, very dangerous because it's very, very real. You know, we get online and we say things sometimes without really thinking about it. But as a believer, we really have to consider 
you know, how many people are going to follow me and take and and uh, and are going to, uh, you know, uh, take what I said and run with it. And this is, by the way, not only not only uh, religious knowledge. Religious knowledge obviously is the biggest threat and the biggest danger because it affects our dunya and our akhirah. But also when it comes to what we say and the information we spread, when it comes to worldly knowledge. And I can't help but think about, you know, the pandemic, COVID, and how people were coming online and, you know, making assumptions and saying, I, and I'm sure a lot of you remember this, I, you know, in America, I remember when we, when we first heard about COVID, you know, in China and this and that, people were like, oh, nothing to worry about, it's just the flu, right? I'm sure, I'm sure many of you, you heard, it's, it's just the flu, nothing to worry about, no big deal. Just, you know, belittling this issue, and I often think, subhanAllah, may Allah protect us, but how many people possibly endangered others um, by, you know, belittling this issue? Uh, it's one thing if you're qualified, right? You, you are, um, you know, you're, you're a scientist or you're in the medical profession, um, you know, you're qualified to speak on the matter. Okay, you do your due diligence. And once again, you're sincere, you tried your best, conveyed some information, even if you're incorrect, inshallah ta'ala, that is something that you may not be held accountable for. But imagine people doing it out of negligence or imagine people doing it from hearsay. They heard something and they passed it on. The Prophet ﷺ said it is enough uh, for a person to be considered a liar if they just pass on what they hear, right? If all oh, we don't, we don't check what we hear. We just hear something, we pass it on, that this is enough information for this person to be considered uh, a liar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, protect us. But that is the other side of the coin here. So uh, you know, uh, we, uh, we don't want to be in that position. So once again, the rule here for us is when it comes to questionable or doubtful matters, we want to restrain ourselves. And also on top of that, we can add in the matters that, you know, we said, uh, you know, give everyone the benefit of the doubt that they're not going to do things that are evil or bad. Uh, but let's say a person does do something evil or bad, but once again, giving them the benefit of the doubt that they do it because it's a personal weakness or it's a temptation for them or whatever. Um, from our deen also is that to minimize the impact of it. Now, someone tell me how we minimize the impact of our bad deeds. So go ahead, raise your hand. If we did something bad and we know it's bad, how do we, you know, looking at this verse that we're studying today and, you know, uh, of inspiring other people, how do, if we ourselves, we committed a sin, may Allah protect us, how do we minimize the impact of it. Let's see. Um, uh, Arisha, go ahead. By not telling every everyone about it and asking Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to forgive us and let us uh, to um, resist from doing it again, again, again. Absolutely, absolutely. By not publicizing our sins by hiding our sins. And obviously, as people are saying in the chat as well, um, that we minimize the effect of it or the impact of it by making tawbah as well, right? When we are regretful, and that's why regret is an essential part of our tawbah, so that when we feel bad about it, we won't publicize it. We're not going to talk about it. We're, we feel guilty about it. We feel bad about it. We're going to try and hide it. You know, a very scary hadith, the Prophet وسلم, he said, Kullu ummati mu'afa. He said, all of my ummah will be forgiven or can be forgiven, illa al-mujahirun, except those who publicize, meaning publicize their sins. Meaning this is, and the meaning of the hadith really here is that this is a heart that has become hard. Meaning they, this person won't even seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness if they're publicizing their sins and they're talking about it and they're doing it in public, right? So it's, that's very, very dangerous. And once again, you know, bringing social media here, social media makes this, you know, even a, even, even a bigger problem now because, you know, we are, what we do is no longer private. It's just in general, the default now is that we share everything, right? We, we overshare, that's, that's the default. So uh, subhanAllah, we, uh, you know, before it was, the default was, there was no social media. We did something at least, unless we went and talked to people about it and we call somebody or whatever, it was pretty private. But now the default is we're doing something immediately, click, you know, we got to take a photo. It's got to be on Insta. It's got to be on our story. It's got to be on Snapchat, whatever it is, right? And that, that just increases the danger of, uh, of, of subhanAllah uh, having an impact or our sins having an impact uh, on others. So JazakAllah khair, and I know some people are mentioning in the, in the chat that by, you know, how else do we do minimize the impact? 
by replacing it with good deeds, as we mentioned earlier uh, as well. All very great uh, stuff. So, uh, so this, these, uh, that is one of the main points of reflection that I wanted to talk about uh, today. Uh, the other uh, point of reflection is, uh, in general, if we look at um, our good deeds and even the matters that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made uh, fard uh, upon us, that Allah has obligated upon us, what we find is that um, the early time is, in general, in usual, or usually, uh, it is better. A, a very good example of that is our five daily prayers. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna salata kanat ala al-mu'minina kitaban mawquta. That the, uh, certainly the salah uh, kanat ala al-mu'minin is, is upon the, is enjoined upon the believers uh, uh, ala al-mu'minin kitaban mawquta is uh, upon a fixed time or fixed hour, meaning Allah has set a time for everything. So we can't pray Fajr at the end of the day. We can't pray Dhuhr at the end of the day. Allah has set uh, that particular time. And in general, with our prayers, uh, the early time is considered the better in general. In general, there's a few, few exceptions. I'm not really going to get, get into it. But in general, the best uh, time to pray is the early time when the prayer uh, first uh, comes in. And we know that we talked about uh, earlier in one of our other sessions that one of the uh, signs of the hypocrites is the delaying of the prayer. And we mentioned the narration where the Prophet ﷺ said that they will delay the prayer until the sun is just about to set and they will quickly peck out for rak'ahs, meaning pray it very, very quickly, right? So this is haste here, but it's haste in the deed, not in, in getting to the deed, you know? Uh, when the haste that we're talking about here is getting to do it as quickly as possible. Um, and that requires... Um, struggle, right? It, it's not going to be easy. Uh, it, you know, worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a lot of times that is a challenge and we understand that and we admit that. Um, but also when we, and this is something to think about here, subhanAllah, if this is our goal, right? Our goal is this verse. Uh, and inshallah ta'ala after today, this will become our goal uh, that we want to be those who race, rush to do good deeds uh, and they always take the lead in doing those good deeds, right? They always want to be the first. Well, someone can say now, man, I was already struggling with my, my good deeds. Now you want me to be the first to do it as well? Like, that's just too much. And, and I'll say to you, yeah, you're right. You know, that is a struggle. It's a struggle upon a struggle. Uh, but remember that that only increases us in reward. And actually, if we look at the next verse, which I had the brother recite, but the beginning of the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, nafsan illa wusaha. And once again, I'm cheating by bringing in a second verse here, but there is an added benefit here. That's why I brought it. That Allah says, uh, nafsan illa wusaha, that we never require uh, from a person or from a nafs or from a soul more than it can handle, more that it has, more than it has the capacity for. Uh, meaning here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's almost as if in the next verse, Allah is encouraging, so in this verse, today's verse, uh, verse number 61, Allah is encouraging us to rush to do good deeds. And then in the next verse, Allah is saying, don't worry, you got it. You can handle it. That even though it may be challenging, Allah will not, uh, Allah will not uh, require from you something that is beyond your uh, capability, All right? So that is, a, once again, it's something that we keep in mind, subhanAllah, uh, anytime we, uh, anytime we, um, we, we rush to do a good deed, that it may be challenging, but if this is something that, inshallah, ta'ala, I have the capacity and the capability for me to do. Uh, okay, so hopefully you have a good understanding of this uh, verse, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, but hopefully you have a good understanding of this verse, and now I would like to hear some of your reflections, uh, inshallah ta'ala. So some of the themes here that we can uh, reflect upon, number one, what is the benefit of doing uh, rushing to do good deeds? So now that you're uh, doing tadabbur of this verse, you're contemplating this verse, this is the question you can ask yourself. What is the benefit of rushing to do good deeds? So that's one thing we can reflect upon. And maybe you have a story or something that happened, you know, you went through uh, the barakah or the blessings you felt from rushing to do good deeds. Also, um, the harm of rushing to do uh, evil deeds or bad deeds or questionable uh, deeds. Uh, also, how another thing to reflect upon, and this is kind of like a summary of what I said today, 
uh, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is putting us already through our deen, Allah is putting us in the habit, or I should say through the requirements of our deen, the requirements of our religion, Allah is already putting us in the habit of doing things early, doing things in the initial time. Um, so uh, so the, the beauty of that. Uh, and lastly, we mentioned the encouragement from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how we need Allah's support in everything that we do. Uh, so uh, yesterday, um, I logged in real quick to check the, uh, the, how, the, how the, uh, the reflection circle was going. Uh, and I realized that uh, the sister uh, who was moderating uh, was the one calling upon people. And I was like, that is such a great idea because that takes the responsibility away from me. Uh, and Sister Hafsa dipped out. I think she might've had some idea that I'm gonna do this today. So she dipped out, but I believe she put uh, Sister Fadisa in charge. Um, so I'm gonna have her call upon people. Uh, I think you know that the moder moderator can also do a better job of keeping an eye on like who, who raised your hand first and you know putting people's hands down and all that kind of stuff. So Sister Fadisa, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Um, first of all, uh, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Is it Fadisa? It's Farisa. Farisa, okay, Farisa, Sister Farisa, I apologize. So Sister uh, Farisa, uh, I'll go ahead and let you uh, call upon people who have their hands up, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, mm -hmm. Once again, as always, try to keep it brief, inshallah ta'ala, because we want to try and hear from as many people as possible. Okay. Okay, so um, oh, it's someone I haven't heard from before. Zakia from the Netherlands? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam. Um. Well, I don't know if you have my English not that well, but um, if you rush to do good deeds, that, that, will, pro that will protect you from laziness. And um, yeah, you never know when you die. So yeah, I think it's good to rush to good deeds and hasanet. And uh, yeah, that, that's what, what, that is what came to my mind. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. That is beautiful, subhanAllah. Uh, that point of when we rush to do good deeds, we don't miss out on stuff. And, and, that, and I don't know if you caught it with Sister Zakia. She said, it's beautiful. Um, we don't know how long we have to live. We don't know. When we delay something, we don't know if we're going to get the opportunity to do it. Right? So let's say, as an example, someone says, you know, I know, I know Dhuhr came in, but I've got like three. And it's summertime right now, depending on where you live. Unless you're in Australia, then it's flipped, right? I don't know if we have any Aussies in the house today. Uh, where they're, I, I believe they're going into winter, but you know, in the, in the other part of the world, uh, the right side up, right, and then the wrong side, you know, being uh, Australia on the bottom. <laughs> but uh, in this side of the world, right, days are getting longer, and so we're like, oh, you know, especially coming out of winter, where you know, we reached a short time, we uh, so the days are getting longer. We're like, oh, I have like three hours, mashallah, three, four hours to pray the and we we just delay it and delay it and delay it. Well, the reality is the more we delay, the more we're putting ourselves in a position where we may not get the opportunity to do so. And this is not only, by the way, I know we're thinking, you know, we're talking about death. We're talking about, we don't know how long we're gonna live. Sometimes it's not even that. It's just that you have free time right now. Or you have the opportunity to do it. Maybe we push it till there's 10 minutes left, but in the 10 minutes, something happens and you know, we're physically not able to pray. Then what, right? Uh, so this aspect of our worship, you know, making us, us uh, helping us fight that laziness and, and getting the most out of our, our worship, a beautiful point. Zakallah khair, sister. Thank you so much. Um, next person, sister Jessica from Indonesia. Hope, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. All right. Okay. Almost like what Sakia said before. So when we do good deed, we have to think that we never know when Allah will call us, means when we're going to die. So I cannot imagine when I do the bad thing, then suddenly Malaikat Maud uh, come and ask me to go to Allah. So it's, it's really, it's really, really, I cannot imagine that. That's the other the one thing. The other thing is that uh, now in the world, it seems like in the mainstream media, the bad news, it's a good news, right? That's why uh, I think we have to also rushing in spreading the good deed into the social media as well. 
because today if if all the bad news like mainstreaming it means like people believe that the bad news is the correct one but if all people uh, who usually do the good deeds they also flowing the social media with with all of the good deeds then at least we can have balanced information and people do not believe only into the bad deed but also the good deeds i think that's awesome. all Awesome. That's beautiful. That's a beautiful point. Uh, there's so much, you know, bad that gets put out there. You know, they say uh, any press is good press, like even if it's bad press, just to get people's attention. Uh, but, you know, rushing to spread goodness rather than, you know, all the bad that is out there. Excellent. Okay, next is Ahmed. Hi, Ahmed. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh, and everyone else. So this verse actually reminded me of the verse from Surah Toha, uh, verse 83, where um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to Musa alayhi salam. And he says, um, why have you hastened, ya Musa? And uh, Musa alayhi salam responded in the next verse saying, um, oh Allah, I have hastened um, so that you may be pleased. And um, so from this, we know that Allah is pleased um, at you know those who rush you know towards him to um, do good deeds to do our ibadah and I think that's the sort of attitude that we should all keep yep that's my reflection thank that's you a beautiful beautiful reflection Zakallah khair. thank you so much for for sharing that uh, and this is something we find uh, common amongst the prophets uh, and especially the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa that being at the forefront uh, being uh, you know at uh, rushing to do to do goodness as one of the characteristics that the prophets had. So, Jazakallah khair. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, uh, Sister Anaya. Assalamu alaikum. So, um, I was going to say that if you're busy doing good deeds, you're not going to really have time to sin or even have negative thoughts. You know, it's for instance, if you're teaching at a Sunday school or you're volunteering somewhere. Not only are you busy, but you will find yourself, you know, more content and finding more joy, uh, especially if you're seeing like, for instance, if you're teaching at the Sunday school and you see the kids and the progress they're making and all of that, you will be tired towards the end of the day. You're not going to really have time to even care about what's going on on social media or who does what, you know, so, um, and, it, and at the end of the day, when you do see, I, I guess you, sh you could say the fruit of your labor, you know, it's like kind of the positive impact it's making, it will make you rush more the good deed. It will encourage you. And uh, just the last thing that I wanted to add is just to always start with Bismillah, um, everything. And when you do finish it, say Alhamdulillah, because even when we are doing a good deed, it is a law that moves our heart to do it. So, you know, not taking credit for Allah guiding us and helping us do it. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Jazakallah khair. That is, uh, that is beautiful. Uh, spending our time, getting our time involved in uh, the goodness so we don't even have time to uh, get involved in any of the evil or the bad. Uh, that's very true, especially, you know, as Sister mentioned, when it comes to social media, uh, I often say like the reality is that people are on social media. Right? I don't think we live in a time where I guess some people could stay off of social media. And I, I know a few people that are like, I'm not online like this. And like, okay, cool, more power to you. Um, but the vast majority of people are online because so much of our lives is just incorporated. To, you know, they're just, it's just, you know, it's on the internet. So what can we do? Uh, but if we're going to be on the internet, then using that time uh, for good, using up our time for good, so we don't even have time uh, to get into any of the questionable stuff. Jazakallah khair. I've also been trying to stay off of Insta and Facebook for this month, so I can relate to that. Yeah, so that's uh, I, so that's a big thing. Uh, a few years ago, I, I, you know, I heard people fasting from social media, which I was like, that's that's awesome, right? That's 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 awesome. That's a that's a wonderful uh, sunnah, sunnah, not as in you know sunnah of the Prophet said, but a wonderful practice that we could you know be from that hadith where the Prophet said, said he said, whoever starts something good, they will have the reward of the person who started it. So Sister Farisa, you know, maybe somebody hears this now and they're inspired to, you know, stay off of social media other than Zoom, I guess, so they can continue to attend uh, these, these, uh, these halaqas and these gatherings. Uh, but, you know, uh, you get the reward for that. Allahumma ameen. Inshallah. So, uh, hmm. next. 
of FIFA from India. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Yes, so uh, it's actually a story of mine um, to hasten my prayers. Uh, and it's all because of my father. So we are three siblings and we always struggle in our prayers. We used to be lazy about it. We would send each other first, like you go and do the wadu first. And uh, gradually our father, he is like so, um, uh, he's very, um, you know, he's very particular about this. So even before the azan starts, he tells us, come on, make wudu. And as soon as the azan goes, you guys go and pray. And sometimes he would just take us all and he would like, we would pray in jamaat. And even in Fajr, we don't have an alarm clock. He just wakes up wow. early and he's like, as salatu khairu minan no. And everyone's like, oh, we have to wake up. <laughs> so like time went by and I think, you know, the five daily prayers, like it literally, I feel like it sets right our direction every day you know and once we are sure of the road we have taken then we run towards gaining uh, Allah's pleasure and we compete with each other in that you know we become selfish for the hereafter by being selfless in this wor world world that you know that point of uh, the re or the reflection upon prayer uh, that's why I mentioned it as well, because it is actually very powerful. Uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, legislates certain matters, uh, there's always a, a wisdom for that. So, and actually, you know, if you really think about the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in obligating the prayers, you know, five times a day and at very particular times and have set times, there's so many benefits that we can uh, think about and, and, and understand. But one of them is this very issue, right? Just uh, setting the correct tone uh, for the rest of our life. So, Zakallah khair. Excellent, excellent uh, reflection. Yeah, it's nice having a human alarm clock. That's great. Um, Aisha from Canada. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, I think what I can say is that the more you... The more time you spend for Allah, Allah spends it for you. So like whenever you will, whenever, whenever you're doing a, a, a good deed, you know that it's, it's being collected in the Akhirah. So like, I think that's how you can put it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Zakallah khair. Zakallah khair. Uh, one of the reflections that I, I, sh I wanted to hold off on, I wanted to hear from you before, before I share uh, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, Allah says, Ulaika yusari'una fil khayrat, that they are the ones who race to do al khayrat. And khayrat is, is good deeds, but, um, and I, and I kind of knew this was going to happen, but, you know, and I did set the tone for this. When we think of good deeds, we think of particular outward acts of worship, which is normal, which is, you know, it's, it's very obvious to us. We think of prayer, we think of, you know, dhikr and, and charity and so on and so forth. Uh, but khairat for us, good deeds are actually also deeds of the heart, right? Um, purifying our heart. So when it comes to, you know, doing tazkiyah and purification, uh, the believers are also those who are, are quick to, or uh, they, they race to purify their hearts. And that requires that, that a person uh, does some self-analysis that they do um, what is called uh, taking an account of oneself, being honest with oneself, right? That some people, and I thought about this, subhanAllah, some people have a problem that they keep putting off and putting off. And putting off. Someone has an anger problem, for example, they keep putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. Someone has a jealousy problem, right? They keep putting it off and putting it on. I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. I'm okay. They, you know, somebody comes and advises them. They're like, no, no, it's okay, whatever, I'm okay. Uh, or a problem with arrogance or something, you know, these matters of the heart or these diseases of the heart, we also want to be from those who uh, rush to um, rectify our hearts and, and purify our hearts as well. Uh, and the reality of that is that that becomes very personal uh, because a lot of these matters of the heart, um, no one really knows the, the, the reality of them, uh, you know, like ourselves. So if I'm going to judge like how jealous I am, for example, like, other people can't do that for me. That's something that I have to do for myself, right? And how bad it's gotten or how much I've improved or whatever. Uh, 
so that becomes a very personal matter. Uh, and it, therefore, you know, it, it's, a, it's a difficult discussion sometimes to have that discussion with oneself, uh, but also, you know, rushing and, and, and wanting to do that as quickly as possible, uh, ridding ourselves of, of a lot of these problems before they begin to affect, you know, and I, I thought about this as a parent, right? Uh, when we have these problems, we can pass these down to our kids. Uh, and, and, you know, we talked about the flip side of this, of, the flip of doing something bad and then other people following in it, um, you know, so we want to be those who pass on to our kids these good deeds. You know, this is why, the, you know, Sister Afifa, she said that, you know, my dad, you know, my dad wakes up for Fajr and he wakes it up, he wakes everybody up and so on and so forth. And it's like, look, he was the first, right? He set the tone. And then now his kids, inshallah, Ta'ala will follow, you know, Sister Afifa follows and inshallah Ta'ala, the next generation after her. And Allah knows how many people have been inspired. So that's, you know, that's that's something that we want to get the, the reward for, inshallah Ta'ala. Inshallah. So in the chat, Nazia Mushtaq says, sometimes when you delay good deeds, the shaitan can get to you and delay or even stop you from doing the deed. For example, if you wanted to give charity, if you delay it, you might end up giving less than you originally wanted uh, Don't or don't give at all. SubhanAllah. Sorry, I can't speak. Oh, okay, she's in the nursery. So that was her note. Excellent, excellent point. Uh, sometimes uh, you're, and you may have experiences actually, uh, you're at a fundraiser or you go to the masjid and there's an like impromptu fundraiser or whatever. And they're like, you know, give whatever you can, give whatever you can. And you look at your wallet and you're like, okay, I guess I have, you know, 50 bucks, but you know what I can do is I can go home and I can log online and I can send some money and this and that or whatever. And the whole time the shaitan's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, homie, just delay it a little bit. Like you can do better, just, just wait, just wait, just wait. It would be better that a person says, let me give what I have. And then if I can do more, I'll go home. I'll, you know, think about it. Or someone says, uh, you know, brothers often say, uh, let me talk to my wife about it, right? Which homie never talks to his, never consults his wife on anything. But now all of a sudden when it comes to giving charity, he's like, let me, let me talk to my wife real quick. You know, I got to discuss it with her before I have to give charity, right? All in a, <laughs> it's bad a lot, to, just to delay it. And then delaying means that perhaps it, it may not get done. Uh, so excellent, excellent reflection. Zakallah khair. That was, that was beautiful. Go to the dream in the UK. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, I wanted to touch on something, um, and it was to do with kibble of pride, um, and the verse that Sheikh mentioned. Um, so Allah mentions lots of times about how we should only be hasting our good deeds and how we run towards that. And um, it shows that because it's mentioned in different surahs, even in Surah Waqiyah, you know, the forerunners, uh, they are from closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's really important to note that Allah knows that us humans as, and I'm not speaking from like a psychological matter, but as humans, we have like a, Allah knows that we have like this tendency to sort of run towards things, not necessarily to be better than someone, but uh, we have that inner race in ourselves. And that's why he allows that, not, I don't wanna say pride, but I wanna say healthy pride. Please don't take it the wrong way. But he allows this healthy pride within us to race in our good deeds. And we know that because the most forerunning of all people, at least from what I've seen are children actually, and therefore I need to know because they are so pure and so innocent, mashallah. Um, I used to teach in a mosque and I used to see this all the time. Um, I'm sure there's lots of parents here and maybe you have more than one kid and they'll raise to know more than the other. But that transition from where we were younger and we grow up, our race to good deeds have sort of been tarnished with sort of bad pride and ego and stuff. And that's how we know that Allah has made us capable of uh, controlling our uh, pride and why we do our good deeds. Um, but yeah, I just think that's something important to know. Oh, that's, that's, that's awesome, subhanAllah. Uh, human beings by nature, we can be quite competitive. Uh, and I love the example that the sister gave of children. Uh, and I, I'm a parent, so I could definitely relate to what she was talking about, you know, by nature. Even my, my six-year-old and two-year-old, are competing with one another, even though there's like a four-year difference. Um, 
And, you know, even, I mean, all parents have done this, like who's going to finish their dinner first. And it's like, oh, now they're going to start eating quickly. Right. That's just, that's just how, how, how kids are. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us such a positive, um, positive release for that, that be competitive, but be competitive uh, in goodness, right? For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that, uh, so that's, a, that's a wonderful point. Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much for, uh, for sharing that. That was great. Okay, we have a few minutes left. So Aisha Yeah, let's take, from, let's take one more person, inshallah. One more person. Aisha from Karachi, Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam. I wanted to talk about how when a person does something for the first time, uh, it can basically uh, multiply and reward when other people see how that first person did that thing. Um, then they can uh, basically improve on it even more. For example, when you were asked to transmit even one verse, then uh, so that maybe the person who comes later after you, they get a better understanding of that thing. So the first person who did that thing the first time and the way he did it and the means he used, the uh, other people can improve on that. So that first person is going to get the reward for doing that thing the first time actually. And then the first, uh, then as the other people go on improving on it, the, the reward also goes to the first person. Also, uh, uh, since I have a background in medicine, so I wanted to link the multiplication of reward to the process of mitosis, where, a, where one cell divides into two, that two divides into four, that four divides into eight. So it's like a multiplication process. Uh, also, we get in the Quran the word uh, you go uh, which means manifold or twofold. So it, it's just like links how that multiplication process goes on, continues on, increases. Exactly. That was that was awesome. I was like. Three, four, like quick fire points, uh, alhamdulillah, all of them great. Uh, but I, I particularly love the, the first reflection that uh, our sister had when she said that, um, you know, people may, uh, they may outdo you and do more. Like we started something, we did like the best we could do or whatever. But the next person who comes who's inspired by us, they may do it better than us. And, and they may take the baton and run and like accomplish things that we never even thought that we could accomplish. And from the blessings and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that we get reward for that. And so subhanAllah, you know, we may, you know, we, we earlier, you know, in early session, we talked about, you know, doubting one's abilities and so on and so forth. You don't know who you're going to inspire and the change that they can bring. So perhaps you started something, you did a certain amount of effort, you did whatever you're able to do, but someone comes after you and, you know, they, they're able to do something uh, way beyond something you, which you even imagined. Uh, so that's also the, the barakah that comes from this. Uh, awesome. Awesome. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair. Thank you for, for sharing that. I think that's a good uh, note to, to end on. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit selfish here. Uh, I noticed some people were posting their charity, different charities in the, in the, in the, um, in the chat. So I'm going to post one of the projects that, that I've taken. That's actually the first public project that I've ever taken on uh, in terms of raising money for a charity. Uh, it's for an area known as uh, Sarparkar in Pakistan. Uh, so, you know, those of you who are from Pakistan or you're, uh, you know, uh, it's a, it's a vast desert land and they, they have, they are the people there, uh, um, you know, millions of people don't have some of the basic, basic necessities uh, of life. So the project that I've taken on is to build uh, a smart village for them where they can uh, have access to water. And so they have continued access uh, to water. So if you want to help in any other way, I mean, my, my request would be uh, donate to all of these charities that have been mentioned, inshallah ta'ala. And if you don't know who to donate to, just take a little bit and give it to whatever you're going to give, take a little bit and give it to all of them. But I'm going to, boom, post my link as well. Uh, so go check that out. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka tu walaikum. Jazakumullahu khaira. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah Today's session was great as always. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, please check out Sheikh Saad's uh, link that he just posted for his charity. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody about all the all access pass. I'll put it in the chat. Um, and we will see you tomorrow, same time, same place. Thank you, everyone. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm going to end it right there.